while they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This morning we just want to talk from the subject of soul food. Soul food. Soul food. Come in thy people bless and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness on us to sin. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. 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 Collard greens. Yams. Mashed potatoes. Gravy. Biscuits. Cornbread. With a slice of pound cake on the side. And let us not forget the red Kool-Aid. <laughs> or you can do sweet tea, whichever one. Whichever one is better. For you, doesn't that sound like a great dinner right about now? Yeah. No. Aren't you waiting for me to pronounce this benediction so you can go and find you a place where you can you can eat all this good soul food and 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 and, 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 and you can eat until you get the itis. <laughs> go home and lay it down for a while, then get up and watch a little WrestleMania this evening. <laughs> Nothing like some good soul food that that can make you make you feel a little better. You know, you, you know how you all make your food. You got your own little special sauces. You got your own little special ingredients that, that you use to make it just right for you and you don't want anybody else to know your secret recipe. <laughs> we know how to add our flavor just to make it taste just right for us. But I want to submit to us today that while I know we all love a little soul food every now and again, there's a meal that's not as elaborate as Granny's dinner on Sunday, but I guarantee you, if you eat it with the right spirit, it's more pleasing and filling for our souls. This meal won't make you sleepy, but it will make you grateful. It won't fill you up, but it'll fill you with joy. You don't have to order it off of a menu. This meal is ordained by God. You don't even have to get all dressed up to partake of it. You don't have to make reservations. All you need to do is come as you are and bring your faith with you. It may not be a five-star meal, but it was given to us by the bright and morning star. It may not even be a five-course meal, but you ought to be glad today that Jesus stayed the course so that we are all able to partake of this divine soul to the table and partake of holy communion. I ought to do something for your spirit. I ought to do something for your soul. All the hell you went through in those previous 30 days. All, all those decisions that you had to make. All those ups and downs and twists and turns. And yet you're here. You find yourself here to be able to share in the Lord's supper. How in the world can you come to church and not be happy? That you can commune as friend with friend and we can come together as one in the spirit and one in the blood and be able to take part in communion. Oh, this is soul food. Because it's food for your soul. I was looking at this text this weekend and even before we got to the soul food dinner, all these different things had to take place. See, they were plotting 
to arrest and kill Jesus. But but the thing of it is, they wanted to sneak around. They wanted to do it in a stealth-like manner because they knew it, that if they arrested Jesus in the public square, it was a riot that was about to take place. Then, before we get to the soul food dinner, it, it, Jesus was anointed by the woman with the alabaster jar. You know, the one with the very expensive perfume. Then, then we find on top of that, Judas, <coughs> one of the original twelve. The ones that Jesus called out. He made his way to the chief priest and decided that he was going to be the one to betray Jesus. All because he needed the money. All of this happening before the meal even takes place. Plotting, scheming, anointing, betrayal. All before dinner is served. Sounds like a good soap opera, don't <laughs> Jesus knew that the hit was out on him. And he knew he couldn't be seen in public. So he instructs the disciples to go into the city. And there they would find a man who has a jar of water. He says that you need to follow him. And when he takes you into the house, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover? with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs furnished and ready. This upper room was the place that was used for this Passover meal. All the preparations had been made. The bread was there. The wine was there. Bitter herbs and spices. They had sauces made out of dried fruit. And then they had the roasting of the Passover lamb. It was during this delicious meal that Jesus makes the shocking declaration that someone around this table, someone who is sharing a meal with the master, will soon betray him. Be careful who you go and eat with. Because you may find yourself dining with some haters. A close friend. A trusted confidant would soon sell Jesus out. We got to remember Jesus picked Judas. He was one of the twelve chosen to follow Jesus. But the disciples said, surely not I. I know he's not talking about me. Who me? Couldn't be. But Jesus says to them, yes, one of you will betray me and woe unto you. For it would have been better for that one who betrays me to have never been born. All of this has taken place on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. But can I share with you a little history about the Passover meal? See, the Passover meal was always celebrated in an atmosphere of worship. All of the participants took their places at the table and, and the head of the family pronounced a blessing over the feast and the wine. Then they drank a cup of wine in memory of having been led out of Egypt. Then a story was told of, of the children of Israel's redemption from Israel following, followed by a song of praise and a singing of the Psalms. See, you saw you saw the Psalms back then. We have the ability to read them now, but back then, Psalms were all sung because Psalms were poetical music. And so this is what they were doing. They were singing the Psalms. They were singing Psalm 111 through 113 as an act of praise and, and worship. Then after they got done singing, then they drank a second cup of wine. It was drinking memory of having been freed from slavery. The next part of the ceremony was that the head of the family blessed the bread, which was then passed around and eaten with bitter herbs and stewed fruits. This was the beginning of the meal. The unleavened bread represented the bread of affliction in Egypt. Bitter herbs represented the bitterness of being in slavery. The stewed fruit that looked like clay represented the bricks that were made while they were enslaved in Egypt. And the roasted Passover lamb symbolized the passing over of Israel in the plague. You got to know why you're doing what you're doing. And the history why 
or the history behind why you were doing what you're doing. And at the end of the meal, the head of the meal, the head of the family, blessed the third cup of wine, and it was drunk to celebrate God's mighty act of redemption. Then they sang more psalms, and the celebration concluded before midnight with a fourth cup of wine that was drunk in honor of God, taking his people to be with him forever. So this Passover meal was more than a meal. It was a celebration. It was an act of worship because they, they had to remember from which they came Amen. to celebrate where they are now. Amen. Let me say it again. Sometimes we got to remember from which we came uh -huh. in order to celebrate where we are now. Amen. Time of celebration was the Passover feast. It was, it was a worship remembrance. And at the same time, they were looking forward to great expectations of the future. And so when Jesus institutes his last supper with the disciples, he, he's taking on the same uh, 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 ritual of the Passover meal, but he's adding his own flavor. See, he became the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. And so after Jesus and the disciples sing songs of praise, the, the Bible declares that Jesus takes the bread, and he, he gives thanks, and, and, and he broke it. But when he said, this is my body, Jesus was saying that he is the bread of life. And when we partake of his body, it signifies eternal life for us. The cup that had previously been associated with God saving Israel, Jesus now proclaims that, that the blood that was poured out of the cup was poured out for many, was the same blood that was used to seal a covenant. Amen. The blood signifies covenant. If you remember in the early history, people, they, they didn't shake on it. They signed off deals in blood. So when Jesus put his blood with my blood, when Jesus put his blood with your blood, when Jesus put his blood with your blood and your blood and your blood, you in covenant with him. Yeah. Yeah. He says, you're mine. Yeah. And when he is. Yeah. And that covenant promises eternal salvation to all of his disciples. Jesus says, I'm going to be with you every time. You're going to feel my presence every time you gather together to break bread. That's why we can't take this sacrament lightly. That's why we can't take this sacrament as something we just do every first Sunday by way of habitual ritual. It means more than that. We all not divided. You know what makes, what bothers me? Is when, when persons take their communion and then decide it's time to go home. Why are you missing the point? <laughs> Communion is about you staying in worship. It's about us being in worship. For if it had not been the blood yeah, yeah, yeah. that came out of the body, yeah. we wouldn't even be here. Remember your history. Go back to the early Methodist Episcopal Church. A church that wasn't even made for us. The church that said we wasn't good enough to take communion at the same time as our Caucasian counterparts. A church that said, you know what? Y'all get y'all communion up in that balcony. We'll bring your communion to you. We don't want you coming to the altar because you're not worthy enough to receive it at the same time as the rest of the parishioners. This is why we got the AME Zion Church. This is why we got the AME Church. It was born out of oppression. It was born out of slavery. It was born out of not being treated as equal. So I get offended when we take communion as if we doing God a favor. But we ought to take communion knowing that Jesus favored us. We should never take Holy Communion lightly. We should never dilute or demean the sanctity of this ritual. I'm glad, I'm glad that we have committed the words to memory. I'm glad that we know the general confession by heart, but the meaning of it is greater than the memorization of some words. 
we ought to find ourselves in the words. We, we must find ourselves at the table with the twelve. One disciple doubted. We doubt. One disciple betrayed Jesus. We betrayed Jesus. Yes, even you with your sanctified self. <laughs> Everything that you can find in the disciples, you can find in us. And we still are able to come to the table. Somebody ought to be glad about that today. Still kept us when we didn't want to have a relationship with Christ. But because we didn't want the relationship didn't mean that Jesus didn't want the relationship. This soul food that we're about to receive is much more than a ritual. It's a, a soul redeemer. It's a soul saver. It's a soul deliverer. And every opportunity we have to partake in this sacrament, we ought to be grateful for another chance to come to the table. Y'all, anybody get what I'm saying today? Yeah, so what else can we learn about this soul food meal? As it not only nourishes our soul, but it blesses our soul. First thing about this meal, we need to understand that it's a redeeming meal. It's a redeeming meal. When, when any one of us sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's not only the sacrificial atonement for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So by Jesus sacrificing his life for us and taking on our sins to him, we're free to live better lives, more devoted lives, lives of greater service to Christ and the church. You're not, you're not bound anymore by what people used to think about you, what people used to say about you. Jesus has wiped the slate clean of our transgressions and tossed them into the sea of forgiveness, never to be brought up again. The terms and conditions on your old lease have now expired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through Christ Jesus, you now have a new lease on life. Your past has nothing to do with your future. Amen. Your yesterday has nothing to do with your tomorrow. You can sleep like a baby now. Because all that stuff that used to affect you back then, yes, it just rolls off your back right now. Amen. Can I tell some people in this place, don't let anybody get you anymore. <laughs> God has delivered you from that. That's right. Amen. So if people want to keep bringing up your past to you, you just start walking past them. Amen. Amen. God has given you a new lease on life. So the old you don't even matter anymore. If God's not holding it against you, don't let man hold it against you. Amen. We can come to the table with, with the peace that comes from knowing that we have been redeemed. So if anyone looks surprised and anyone can't smile and let them know that you've been redeemed. Yes. Yes. Second thing we need to understand, this is a meal of confession. This is a meal of confession. We all not kid ourselves by thinking that, we, that we've always got it right. But we always have it together. Yes, we all have sinned. And, and we sin by thought, word, and, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. So not only does the punishment fit the crime, God could be justified in kicking us to the curb because of the crime. But his will is to always have mercy. That's why we have to earnestly repent and be truly and heartily sorry for all we've done against God. We ought to come to the table confessing that we have fallen short. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Instead of coming to the table acting like we ain't never done nothing. Yeah. Isn't this a hospital? <laughs> so people come to a hospital when they're sick, right? Yeah. So if you need to be healed from your sickness, you ought to go to the doctor, right? Yeah. So let us not just act like we ain't never done nothing. But take that hat off. <laughs>
with, with the church general. We act so sanctified that we really act in sanctimonious. Got to come to the table confessing that we have made mistakes and that we will continue to make mistakes, but, but God, please have mercy on us. That when we fall short, you don't kick us to the side, but that you pick us up and that your love is anyway. So it's a meal of confession. The third thing is, it's a community meal. It's a community meal. There are no big eyes and little U's at the table. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm the one that has the appointment, but I'm also your brother in Christ. You need grace, I need grace. You need mercy, I need mercy. There's no differing in age, how long you've been in the church, what your title is, or what your position is. When we come to the table, we are one. All standing in the need of grace. All standing in the need of, of prayer. And don't you think if Jesus could bring all those different characters together with all their issues and all their attitudes and bring them together at the table as one, he can do it for this church. Amen. It's a community meal. Communion. Community. Communing with unity. Coming together as one. Unity. You and I tie. I ain't no greater than you. You ain't no greater than me. We in this thing together. We both trying to do our very best to get it right. So God have mercy on us. Yes. Yes. Got to put all these egos and attitudes and, and issues to the side when we come to the table. We ought not have all against our brother and sister when we come to the table. We ought not treat this thing as if it's something to do. Hmm. And some of us right now will get mad if we don't have communion on the first Sunday of the month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what I'm talking about. <coughs> but Jesus said, as often as you do this, yeah. do this in remembrance of me. So what's more important, remembering Jesus or the ritual? Amen. It's community meeting. We in this thing together. No one is greater than the next. We all in this together. Fourth thing is a memorial meal. You got to remember what Jesus has done for you. We remember the one who suffered, bled, and died. He went to the cross on our behalf. The same one that on the third day he got about that grave with all power in his hand. Right. His sacrifice and his love for us should be the only thing that we're thinking about mm -hmm. as we take communion. Amen. Can anyone in this place declare that I know it was the blood? Mm. I know it was the blood. Yeah. I know it was the blood for me. Yeah. One day when I was lost, he died. says he never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word for me. Oh, you got to worship a God who, who takes it all for us. And doesn't even open his mouth. Not because he knew his purpose. And because Jesus knew his purpose, your life has purpose. It blows my mind. We got family members who won't cross the street with us. And we got a Savior who went to the cross for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we got to remember that we are what we eat. <laughs> See, when we partake of the sacrament, we ought to take on the characteristics of the one whose body we're taking on. You can't be evil and then talk about Christ, I love you. You can't be cantankerous and start talking about Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Taking communion ought to make you just a little bit more like Jesus every time you take it. It ought to change your attitude. It ought to change your outlook. It ought to change your outcome. How in the world can you not be changed after 
that Jesus has gotten into your life. How in the world can you stay the same when his blood has been, been infused in your blood, when his body becomes your body? How can you not have a wonderful change come over you? See, in the early church, there was this thing called transubstantiation. Whereas the ordained priest, priest blessed the blood and the wine, they both thought that the blood and the wine literally transformed into the actual blood of Christ. This is what the Roman Catholic Church believed. The Lutheran Church, Brother Harwell, believed in consubstantiation, which, which after the consecration of the blood and wine, they coexist, they, they work together within the substance of the body and the blood of the Christ. I ain't here to talk about transubstantiation and consubstantiation, but I will say that once we take the Holy Sacrament to our comfort, yeah. devoutly kneeling in humble confession to our God, a change should come over us where we are more Christ-like. Yeah, yeah. We should love more like Christ. We should give more like Christ. We should live more like Christ. Our spirit should be a Christ-like spirit, for he should ever more dwell in him and he in us. All we ought to thank God for another opportunity to come to this table in remembrance of what he's done for us. Macy, I know you love me. But you ain't gonna die for me. I know she loves me. But she ain't dying for me. I like to think that you all love me. But when faced with the question of would you die for me, you probably looking for choice number two. <laughs>
God's 